Thank you so much for being here. Um, I believe every one of you should have a uh, piece of paper, and uh, you'll need a pen for this. Uh, could you, <laughs> on that piece of paper, write down what you study and give it a brief description? So I'll give you 20 seconds. Okay, I'll give you one minute. <laughs> yeah, please do it. Please join. <clears throat> Okay, time's up. So just hold on to that piece of paper for now, and um, we'll come back to it later. Uh, so most of you already know my name. Um, I'm a second year studying virology and immunology. So <clears throat> and that's basically viruses and the immune system. You think uh, taking a degree in uh, virology and immunology mean uh, studying everything on viruses and immune system, but now. Nah. I had to wait 44 days to actually first hear the word virus mentioned in a lecture. In 1857, when tobacco was a massively successful cash crop in Nederland, this, this guy, a plant chemist named Adolf Meyer, investigated this disease. He called it the tobacco mosaic disease because of its characteristic look. The harm caused by the disease was often very great, and it caused many regions to completely give up on tobacco cultivation. Biologists were really intrigued at the disease because it was like no other. Um, nothing looked like this disease, and certainly people were losing money because of this disease. Decades passed, and still no one had an, any idea of what caused this disease. It wasn't until 50 years later through a series of careful, ingenious experiments, when they found out that this disease was not caused by bacteria. It wasn't caused by a toxin or poison, but it was caused by a virus. They called it the tobacco mosaic virus. So this was the beginning of our knowledge of viruses, but it was certainly not at all their beginning. Scientists have spent a long time and effort trying to find the first records of viruses. And among the, the earliest is this Egyptian stele from the 1500 to 1300 BC, uh, depicting this priest with a... Ooh, oh, that just refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> with a foot drop deformity. And this is characteristic of poliovirus infection. In 430 BC, a quarter of the Athenian army and many of the civilians died from what was thought to be, have been a virus infection. So viruses have deep, strong relationship with societies. Viruses are always involved in our lives and not only in deaths and in diseases, but also in art and beauty. This paper drawing is of uh, Semper Augustus, which is famous for being the most expensive flower sold during the tulip mania in Nederland. This, these, if you can see the white streaks on that flower, uh, on, the, on the tulip, uh, it was caused by a virus infection. So we've seen these events where viruses become a part of a society, but maybe it's more ingrained in us than we think. The central dogma of molecular biology basically goes like this, that our DNA, through an intermediate, makes a protein. And these proteins basically makes us who we are, what we are like. It gives us our hair color, our eye color. And from what we learned earlier this year, is that only about 1.5% of our DNA makes these proteins. And here's a fun fact. 8% of our human DNA is viral. Technically speaking, if you think about it, you are six times more virus than you are. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, I also know that I like at least 8% of you, even if I don't know who you are. <laughs> so let me spice up this lecture with a little bit of contrast. We've gone through viruses living in us. But 
we also live in a cloud of viruses. In fact, quite literally, in a typical cubic meter of air, we can probably find about 16,000 viruses. And even more are injected when people sneeze or cough, and they can travel up to 160 kilometers an hour. So we live in viruses. We call this universal infection in virology. We have more viruses that infect plants. We have viruses that infect animals. We have viruses that infect humans. And if you think viruses are boring, more recently, we've found viruses that infect us have viruses that infect them. How crazy messed up is that? So all living things are infected with viruses. And computers are infected by viruses as well. But this is completely different. Often when we think of viruses, we think of the really bad epidemics. Influenza, HIV, could anyone think of anything else? Polio, Zika virus this year. But if you consider that our body itself contains trillions of viruses, and most of them don't do anything, some of them might actually be good for us. So in 1780s, Edward Jenner, an English countryman who lived actually just outside of Bristol, observed that milkmaids who was infected by cowpox virus were protected against smallpox virus. And as any ethical scientist would do, he took the cowpox virus, gave it to an eight-year-old boy, and challenged him with smallpox virus. Fortunately, he was correct, and the boy lived. What would the mom do if he died? Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> is from these sets of experiments with uh, cowpox and cows, we derive the term vaccination from the Latin word vacca, meaning cows. Here's another example. <clears throat> Malignant glioma is a very prevalent brain tumor. Now, we're using viruses to treat cancers. We can target specifically cancer cells and kill them without harming our normal cells. We can make cancer cells more susceptible to drugs and our immune system. <laughs> Most of you are probably dreading to know uh, why I've caught this talk, mistletoe on a tree of life. Well, mistletoe is a parasitic plant that grows on trees. Its roots penetrate deep into the tree's branches and sucks out nutrients out of them. <clears throat> Historically, many cultures have believed that mistletoe is a mystical, sacred plant that bestows life and fertility. No relation whatsoever to this lecture, but yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, now, during uh, Christmas, people kiss under the mistletoe. And it's supposed to be romantic, but yeah, I wouldn't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've called this talk Mistletoe on the Tree of Life because we have found viruses that infect all branches of this tree. We biologists call it the phylogenetic tree of life. From, if you recall, universal infection, from bacteria to animals to humans, nothing escaped from virus infection. And neither am I. This title resonates my passion for viruses because it has infected me and became a part of my life, just as, just as it becomes a part of the tree. So I don't mind spending so much effort and took my time uh, studying viruses because I know, just as I know that when I stand under the mistletoe, I won't be alone. I hope you understand why I like viruses and why this field is really, really exciting to me. But I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. It is not our, our professor's responsibility to make us interested, to make their uh, lectures interesting. It is their job to pass on the knowledge to us, and they might need bullet points so we can pass exams. 
research about background stories, research about the first experiment, about the first person who did those experiments, or the first theories in your field, and be inspired by them. No fun facts about your subjects. How many did you know facts do you know? If, you go, if you're going through your lectures, find out little details that you think might interest your friends and remember them. And think outside the box. Challenge everything that you already know. Viruses don't always mean disease. I'm not encouraging you to be skeptical about everything, but I'm encouraging you to think alternatively. How might you solve a problem differently? As a scientist, I love discoveries. I love when uh, there are news about new epidemics. I'm not evil or anything, but uh, <laughs> it makes me wonder what triggered it. And how did it occur? How did it happen? And why now? There was a lot to take in, but if there's one thing I'd like to say from this lecture, is love the things that you do. And as we go back to the piece of papers that you have in front of you, why don't you give it your own title? Why don't you give your own subject your title? <clears throat> um, mine was called The Mistletoe on the Tree of Life. And so your passion needs a story. Why don't you make it personal? And why don't you make it viral? Thank you. All right. Um, so you said we're, we're eight percent viruses, and there's some like percentage come out of it. Yeah. You also said that a lot of them aren't doing anything. Right. Like us. They're not doing anything that affects us, but they must be doing something. Like, are they doing? Are they literally just like swirl around like nothing, or are they doing some sort of like? Right. So we found. Uh, so those viruses are called uh, that. In fact, uh, that in inserts themselves into our DNA are called retroviruses. And uh, why they stay in there is probably because when they get in, uh, they lose the ability to go out. So they're basically stuck with us. So, <laughs> poor them. Uh, <laughs> but some of them have been found to actually messes up our DNA. And that, in a way, promotes evolution. Because if you, have, if you create genetic diversity, you are promoting a survival of some percentage of that population. So there's some kind of function there. At the same time, um, some viruses have been found to promote our immune system and promote a development. So in a way, it's a very, it's a mutual symbiosis because we provide a host for them to replicate. And at the same time, they promote our development as humans. What's your favorite virus? Ooh, tough one. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm really sure that sense. <laughs> oh, I didn't expect that. <laughs> I would say HIV, but that's really boring. We've got that recorded. Oh. Uh, I also like uh, dengue virus and also Zika virus actually because uh, it's blood that comes out of you when you get infected is a lot and it's so smart that they thin your blood vessel so that you bleed and through your blood it infects other people so it's quite gory but good picture <laughs> yeah that's a great question <laughs> thank you where's the blood virus come from? The word virus comes, uh, um, was, it, was it Latin or Greek? But it means poison. And with the uh, story, the beginning, the story of the beginning, uh, with uh, tobacco mosaic virus, um, they, found, they, they found that the sap of the tobacco uh, was infectious. If you just rub two plants against each other, one infectious and one not, that uh, it will infect the other one. And uh, they thought that it might have been some sort of a poison in the virus, uh, in, in the plant. So they called it virus. Great job. Okay, so um, did you have any 
do you think viruses should be classified as one of our one of the living organisms? Yeah, both right. This is the uh, this lecture is recorded. <laughs> um, I would say no. And uh, how many reasons can I talk about? Uh, firstly, because I don't think they are metab metabolically active. That's the that's uh, generic living. That's a living thing. You have to be able to metabolize. You need energy, uh, and viruses only needs energy when they're inside a host. So uh, some people actually think that viruses have two stages, one as a particle and one as a virus, meaning the particle itself is inert. It's outside a host. And when it's inside a host, then it begins. People take that to be like, oh, OK, I'm in the middle. I'm not going to choose either side. Professor Siddell, he thinks viruses are living things because his definition of living things revolves around anything that can mutate is a living thing. And uh, I don't know how much I agree with that because technically um, any DNA can be a living thing, but it's not. Not if you, if you shed your DNA on the ground, like that's not a living thing. <laughs> so I don't think viruses are living things, as simple as that. But if you want to talk later, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a very, very hot debate. Uh, okay. I still love that last line.